Well, hello, everyone. Welcome back to another edition of Speed Tips by Bob and Chad. Uh, we're getting some of this cooler weather finally. Uh, of course, forecast down here, I don't know what is up there for you, Chad, but the forecast for down here is 70s this coming weekend, but then I think it, it, it tanks during, it's pretty cold tomorrow and, and Wednesday, and then it's supposed to start warming back up and and so I think I should be able to get out my boat two more times. Then it's going to probably have to be ready for ready for the shed. It's kind of depressing. It snowed, I think, the last hour and a half here. It hasn't really amounted to anything, but I've already seen snow like three times this year, and this is way too early. It usually, usually we don't see that until sometime in November. So mm. uh, everybody's talking about a bad winter. I hope they're wrong, but. Well, it would be great for the guys that are in the snow business, but, I, you know, my uh, the people that do my house here, I got a letter from them saying that due to the lack of help, they weren't able to plan on doing my house this summer so I, or this winter, so they, I need to find somebody else. And I'm like, oh, man, that's just what I need to do. Weird. Lack of help. Lack of help. Uh, Mikey wants to know why you decided against PRI this year, Chad. Well, uh, that is a, a subject that's been talked about a lot the last couple of weeks. Um, you know, we did that show for 22 or 23 years there, and and uh, with the COVID when it went away, you know, I guess we just we haven't gone back. It's a it's a large expense. We've used the money in in other areas and. Uh, you know, I think the brand is pretty established. So we got the best chassis builders and engine builders and stuff using our distributors are good. So, you know, other than a reason to go to Indianapolis and eat expensive steaks and drink beer, it's, you know, I, we debut all of our new stuff at Boone. We like to be at the track and be more involved with the racer. And I don't know. I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of companies like me that ain't going that are in the hardcore circle track only. You know, if we had some crossover into the, the Dragon Street, it would be a no-brainer. But a lot of my stuff is, it doesn't really, really convert to the other styles of people that go to PRI. So we've kind of just decided that uh, we're going to, again, use the money in other areas and go to different races and sponsor races and, and uh, you know, use a different marketing strategy and be in person at the track instead of at a trade show. So, But speaking of trade shows, we're going to do a little one. Uh, in Rochester, uh, Kevco, Josh, Ruby, and I have been working on it the last uh, couple weeks here pretty hard. We got like 25 vendors signed up for a, a small show, a regional show in, in Rochester at the Main Civic Center on uh, November 19th. That's a one-day deal, 9 to 4. So them little smaller regional shows are a lot easier for us to do. Obviously, PRI is a long way from here, and it's a pretty big, uh, pretty big event. So... We're looking at these smaller regional shows to try and squeeze a couple of shows in and hopefully that one at rochester goes pretty good we got like 25 companies and i think we're going to open it up to uh a swap meet so you racers can buy a spot for less money and bring your used parts and kind of do some pedaling so so stay tuned to that we should have some facebook announcements and things on that here in the in the coming weeks i think it's only about four weeks away so it should be exciting awesome well, that sounds pretty interesting. You know, those those little trade shows are a lot of fun. I, I wish I could come. Uh, I had scheduled something else for that weekend, and I'm trying to see if I can't uh, finagle my way out of doing that. Uh, has not went real well so far, but I'm still working on it. Um, Dan says he's having trouble keeping the right front out of the dirt. Will raising the J bar help on a B mod? Well. I mean, most generally, a lot of times the right front, it's a situation, the biggest thing that we still need to get the right front to get the travel, but what happens is, is a lot of times we run too soft of a compression shock on that right front, and so what happens is, is it goes in, and, and, and instead of being kind of lazy and letting the car roll over smoothly and, and just bump the dirt, the compression is so soft that we slam the dirt in and sorry, slam the car into the corner 
And then, of course, about the time you get on the brake and all the other co components com combined, raising the J-bar, you know, it's a possibility that that, that, that could help. Um, normally, uh, I wouldn't think it would, but, you know, anything's possible. Uh, I, I would say it's more, in, in my you know, shock and spring control is more what I'm thinking the problem is. Um, if you go stiffer on spring, then of course you need to go softer on shock. But if you run a fairly soft spring combination, you definitely need to go stiffer on compression of shock to comp compensate for what's going on there. Um, hi, Scott. Glad to see you're on here or listening to us. That's always awesome. Uh, Casey, thanks for all the content you guys share with us. I have an IMCA Sport Mud. Car is tight in the center of the corner while on the gas. Pretty good everywhere else. If I'm on the top, if I move anywhere else, the car is loose everywhere else. What adjustments would you recommend? What adjustments would you recommend? I've gone from a 500 pound right front spring to a 450 pound spring with not much effort. Well, more than likely, it kind of sounds like there's a little bit of a throttle issue. I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a throttle tight situation to the point where you know, once again, I hate to keep referring to shock absorbers, but, you know, it's very possible that you're running too soft of a rebound. And back to Dan's question, that's another thing. If you're running really, really soft rebound on the left rear, that's going to get the car on the right front pretty hard also. Uh, well, that was a big thing a year ago, that running soft rebound on that left rear. But we're starting to find now where we're actually up in that rebound quite a bit to get more control over what the you know, what the actual left rear is doing because that causes a lot of other issues. So in other words, if you're in a situation where you get on the throttle too quickly and all of a sudden the car pushes, that's very possible that the rebound could be soft. Um, other adjustments, of course, you know, you can work with trail and lead, but then again, once you say if it's pretty good everywhere else, I, I, I'd, I'd question a little bit of that. I, I almost think, you know, like I said, I'm, I don't, I, I happen to be in the shop, shock business, but that's part of the reason I know a little bit more about it too, is you know, we started seeing issues like that. And we started increasing the rebound so that when you got on the throttle, it didn't load the left rear so fast. Maybe race season will start earlier next year and the weather will cooperate. Well, Jeremy, I hope that's the case. Um, it's kind of hard to believe it's almost over. But then, of course, you know, when I went out to my truck this morning and and I just had my long sleeve shirt on and I went right back in the house and got my sweatshirt. I'm thinking to myself, and, and I know those guys at Dubuque is a little on the chilly side at night. So uh, weather wasn't uh, re reminded us of the fact that we're getting closer to Halloween. There's no doubt about that. Fred says, hi, how's everything going out in California, Fred? Um uh, see, Jake, what changes need to be made to accommodate different tires, switching between Hoosiers and American racers? Um, as a rule of thumb, we found that going from the Hoosiers to the American racers, you've got to free the car up a little bit more. Um, the American racer has a little bit more side bite because it's got a little better sidewall as far as, you know, the sidewall flexes a little bit more. So it, it gives you a little bit better side bite. It's a little bit more, try, they tend to have a little bit more grip uh, just because of the difference in the make of the tire. Um, so a lot of times 
we run the car more a little bit more free with the American racers on it than what we do with the uh, the Hoosiers on it. Uh, let's see. Scott wants you to get him some information on the vendor spots at your show. So MidwestMotorsportsExpo.com has all the information. You can go on there, gives all the, the pricing for the spots, and you can sign up on there. So MidwestMotorsportsExpo.com. Uh, Tyler, have a 175 13-inch left rear spring and a 200-pound 13-inch right rear spring. Want to go to an 11 inch right rear to lower the spring table. What weight of right rear should I go to? What do I need to make this work? Um, I would definitely go another 25 pounds stiffer. I, I'd go with a 225 on that 11 inch spring. Um, the only problem sometimes with 11 inch spring, it, it, it's a little limited in travel uh, because, of course, the coils are, uh, you know, there's not as many coils. So, you know, it doesn't travel as much, but uh, um, it works good. I mean, it'll definitely get, you'll get, you'll notice that the car will get on the right rear a whole bunch more with that 11 inch spring. It gives you quite a bit more side bite. And that being said, uh, that's why I'd go another 25 pounds stiffer. What's the date on your show up there in Rochester? November 19th. Um, Sean Jackson. Have a question. I run a quarter mile dirt. Solomon, Idaho. Been racing my whole life. I was doing the tech at one of the last races. And it was Soda Superstock that won a 20 lap race event. Had absolutely nowhere in fact, it still had the rips on the tires, on the front tires, and was flying. I've been scratching my head on how this could happen. Anyhow, um, well, he would definitely have to be uh, pretty smooth. Um, that's that's definite, uh, you know, situation where the car's working good. And one thing about those Wasota cars, they're a pretty neutral handling car because of the rules. Uh, you know, the, the the rules limit a lot of the stuff that you can do. And so those super stocks, um, I'll tell you what, they run really well. They, they do a good job. I couldn't answer the question why it... Uh, Still had the nubs on the tires, but it's it's definitely like I said, it, it, it was not not using any tire. That's for sure. And the racetrack must not have been very abrasive, um, you know. So, combination of both. Hey guys, I got an off-season question for an IMCA Sport Mod. The car has been running great, and finally has been feeling good for the driver. The only issue is the car three wheels all the time. It does it both on tacky, hammer down, and slicked off racetracks. Could this be due to running an 11 inch right rear spring? Most definitely. Um, that's a definite situation. That's one of the things with that 11 inch spring. Once again, you don't have a lot of spring to resist it. so. You know, you're, you're getting a lot of side bite on that right rear tire now because of the spring table. Uh, the ideal thing would be, is, of course, it, you know, if, if we could run a 13 and a 12, uh, and that's where, like, using Chad's drop cup using on the right rear, using that drop cup, which kind of makes it respond and act like a 12-inch, uh, I think is a little bit more consistent uh, than running that 11 inch spring myself i've not been a huge fan of the 11 inch spring I, I don't know it just seems like it's just too short um, I, I just don't think it's got the um, i don't think it's got the rebound capabilities that, it, that, that the 13 inch spring or the 16 inch spring have 
Um, if you would recommend staying with the same spring rate, but going to a 13 inch spring to hold the left front down longer, do you have other tips? Um, once again, like I said, I, I, I would go to a 13 inch spring and run that, that right rear drop cup that Chad's got for the right rear. That's what we put on our sport mods. And that seems to work really well. Um, I, I've been pretty pleased with that. Um, and like well, you know, our normal normal setup is a 175 left rear and a 225 right rear. Um, hey, Keaton. Keaton just got married, I think. Congratulations, Keaton. Well, that sounds exciting. Um, John, is my MSD box overheating by my motor and blowing pistons? Boy, John, I will. Yeah. I'm not a motor man. My theory on engines, yeah, they're supposed to run really well and make my chassis look very, look very good. That's all I can tell you about an, an, an engine. I don't know much about that stuff. You'd have to actually ask a, a real true engine guy. Kevin Stoa. Yeah, give Kevin Stoa a call. He'd, he'd be the guy to answer that question. He's probably one of the better engine builders out there, and he does an awesome job, and he's very, uh, very, very knowledgeable on all this stuff. I mean, he's been doing it. He, he worked for Ganassi before he started his own deal, and so, I mean, he's got a huge background in engine uh chris chad do you have any cool tools to put in between the hinds on the front end to keep from turning one way or the other while you're tightening them and jamming it? using a wrench to keep them straight isn't really ideal yeah that has been a problem for forever usually you rotate the hind one way and then tighten it up as far as you can and uh that's that's not a bad idea I'm I'm taking notes and probably gonna possibly work on something there and uh, we'll see what we can come up with. But we'll be in touch. Uh, Mark, any tips for sheet metal work to make it stronger? Um, I'm always ripping attachment points. Um, you know, we like a lot of that stuff. We double lip it. To the point where we bend it, and so it's a, and some of those attachment points were actually dual thickness. Um, that would be the only thing that I can think of to tell you. I'm trying to make a sketch. So I don't know if you're talking about like lips of like hoods or whatnot, but they do like a double fold on that seam. Trying to figure out how this grow. It's been a long time since I built a body. But it's like something like yeah. that. So you would have, you know, if you're talking about where your seam overlaps, if you overbend that or overbend that and then do a return bend also, that makes that edge of that panel really strong. I don't know if that's what you're kind of referencing there. Or... Yeah, that's what I was talking about. I think that's yeah. a good idea. The only that's thing good. is that one bend, you got to make sure you bend that one first before yeah. you press it because otherwise you, you'd be SOL. Yeah, there's some there's some trickery there with making all that work, but so definitely play with some pieces of aluminum before you double folds and then that uh, the hem pro for rolling the edges on there strengthens the panels too. Yep. Thoughts on a chain on a right rear on a sport mod? Well, you know, I oh, wait a minute, sorry. Let me, I'll answer this one and then I'll go back because I missed one. Um, well, having a chain on the right rear of a sport mod, we run a chain on the right rear of a sport mod because, of course, you know, our cars are overslung. So we, we kind of got to do that to hold the rear end in there when you jack the car up. Um, but once again, I don't, I don't do a lot of load on the, against that chain. I basically put about two turns of a load against the chain so that when the you know the, the spring is not 
sloppy loose in there, but it doesn't have, I mean, it's got probably 40, 50 pounds, maybe a load at the most, um, works really well. If you're in a situation where you really got a choppy racetrack or a heavy racetrack, you know, I'd possibly consider taking that load out of there. Uh, but, you know, putting load against that chain and against that spring definitely helps traction off the corner. But you've got to be really careful on the racetrack condition to make sure you don't. You hit a rut with a lot of load in that spring and all of a sudden the right front's going to turn towards the fence. And, and it can make, make kind of for a mess. The driver will tell you that you gave him an ill handling piece of garbage. He might use more colorful words, but we'll go with garbage for the sake of it. Um, anyway, what's your guys' thoughts on putting a shock on the back side of the rear end and running the slider on the front side of the rear end, uh, left rear? And how should you go about doing it? USRA, USRA B mod. Well, as far as the USRA B mod, you could probably get by with that and be fine. Because uh, that's where a lot of the um, Wasota B mods, which is very similar rule package as you do, run that left rear in front of the housing. I, I think for a B mod, you actually get more traction with it being in front because um, when it, you know when the car steers, you're loading into that spring, and it's going to put more load on that tire. So I think that's a great idea. Uh, how would you go about doing it? You're just basically just flip flipping them, uh, putting the shock in behind. Uh, that works. Like I said, I know a lot of those with soda B mods are that way, and that works pretty well. Uh, can Weirs make a rev nut tool? for a drill. I'm not sure what a riv nut tool is. Is that the one where it's got the threads in it and then you rivet it to a panel, I think maybe? Not sure, I might need a more explanation or send me a picture on the messenger or something there. Sport mod left rear shock rate for a slick 100 pound spring. Um, with that 100-pound spring, and that's another example where we use a little bit more rebound. Uh, Weight-wise, I'm just going to give you a number because uh, that left rear is very um, uh, it's very aggressive. Uh, you know, like the, the, the zero number is maybe 25 pounds, but the one-inch number will be... 350 pounds so it's it's a it's a very digressive or a, a very aggressive uh, left rear shock uh, number wise you know we still run something around a 10 which is you know that's your six inch number uh, but the biggest key is there it ramps up quite a bit um, rebound though when you've got that soft spring and you're using quite a bit of compression in that spring, we've got to control that rebound so that it doesn't try to jump up too quickly and load that tire so fast. So it's not uncommon for us to use a four rebound. Uh, that works pretty well. Uh, you know, back we used to run like a two rebound. Uh, now with that soft spring, we have went to more like a four rebound. We've even tried a five rebound. I think that's a little much, but a four in that neighborhood of a four, three, three and a half to four seems to work pretty good. Rick, hi from California. Well, you know, I tell you what, this California thing's kind of gotten big. We had our new guy start today. He's from Susanville, California. Uh, our other new guy that's starting next week stopped in. He's got his, his family moved out here to Boone. And so we got two Californians, one Northern and one Southern. And uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm liking you California guys. I, I tell you what, uh, these, these guys have been good. And so hi, Vic. Uh, Dan, 
if you were going to build a new car, would you want 52, 53 left side or 55, 56 left side? Well, left side weight is traction. Low left side is more side bite. I tend to like a, a, a car that's about a 54% left side weight with the driver in the car. That seems to be a very neutral car. It has pretty good side bite, has pretty good forward bite. That works pretty good. So in, in that 54 to 55 range, that works pretty good. 56 is a little bit much. You might struggle a little bit with side bite. Then what's going to happen is you're going to have to use more J bar in it or, or more panel bar in it. And then when you do that, you know, you're going to take the chance of binding the suspension up a little bit and making the car feel kind of bound up a little bit. Uh, so uh, that 54, 54 and a half, that seems to be a good number that I always stick around. Uh, front end geometry, A or B mod, what's the purpose of using a cross shaft over separate staggered hind joints uh, in the point of control arm? Is it to change up the camber caster gain or loss? Why do you prefer one or the other? Well, the biggest thing is, is the having the two hind joints is a whole lot easier to adjust camber and caster. The cross shaft one is a little bit more, um, it has less flex to it. So some people believe that the one with the hind joints, that the A-frame itself will flex a little bit more. Um, we still use the one with the hind joints. Uh, we've got our, our A-frames built a little bit more durable so that they're a little stronger A-frame so they don't flex as much and still be able to use the uh, the hind joints. Uh, my chassis builder says we don't need a shock above the pull bar end. Should I put it on and see what happens? What's the benefits? Um, the benefit, the benefit to having an axle dampener shock is it's going to make the car tighter on corner entry. So if you're running that that shock at a at a five to ten degree angle uphill, um, when you get off the throttle, it's going to load the right rear and put more side bite on the right rear tire. So it's going to make the car a little bit tighter getting in. Um, you know, as far as you know, chassis builder says you don't need one. You know, I mean, I definitely go along with what he says. Um, we we run one just to have a little bit more control, uh, so that it doesn't unload the pull bar quite so fast. Um, uh, I, sometimes I think with these tires that we run, like especially with these IMCA Hoosiers. Um, they're a little harder tire, so I try to do things not to shock the tire. So if I can slow any movements down some, that seems to work pretty well. Right front frame, right frame rail hitting the dirt. Right front shock is a 5'8", 550 pounds spring, 10'2", left rear, USRA B mod. Boy, Dan, I, I don't know what to tell you. That's, I mean, that's pretty good spring rates and a, a five compression shocks, pretty, pretty stiff. I mean, that's, uh, I, I wish I had more input to help you with that. I'm not really sure what, what the situation is. Um, could very well be the fact that you might have a lot of anti-dive in that right front corner. Um, that when you go to get on the brake, it 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 it's kind of lets that thing get down there too fast. Um, I know we have taken anti dive out of the right front and helped that situation. Uh, we did it on a McBurney's car one night at Boone. He, he kept complaining that he felt like the car just got on the right front too quick, 
and we had it shocked accordingly and spring wise was pretty good so we just changed the anti-dive in that because uh, we've got pills in his car we changed the anti-dive and leveled that out a little bit and that seemed to fix the problem that he was having uh that particular night anyway Okay. Hi, Bob and Chad. We really appreciate all the info and rewatch all the episodes. My question is on a USRA B mod on the sliders in front. Car is good through the corner, but snaps loose coming out of the corner to the mid straightaway. Would this be a suspension bind or something else? Thanks again. Look forward to coming to school. Signed up for the Threeling School. Awesome, Adam. That'll be good. We look forward to having you. Um, we've actually got quite a few people already signed up for all three schools, to be honest. Uh, we're, last year, we sold out the stock car one, and the sport mod was pretty darn close. Um, back to your question. Uh, it might be a possibility that you've got too much trail in the car to the point where the car comes up off the corner and, and all of a sudden, you know, it, it could be some suspension binds. I mean, that's not uncommon. Uh, I don't normally see, su see suspension binds. Usually you don't see suspension binds tend to be more mid corner where you're getting full travel on everything. Um, Coming up off the corner, that's that's rare. I'm not saying that it couldn't be something at the end of the travel. Um, well, as an example, the drive shaft could be uh, bottoming out. You know, when you when you you know when you're full under torque coming up off the corner and you get maximum movement on the rear end, the left rear is coming forward. It's very possible the drive shaft could be bottoming out in the transmission. We had. Uh, uh, in fact, we've got a video that we use at school, uh, put an in-car camera in, in a young man's car one time, and he made the comment before we put the camera in there that he didn't know what was going on, but something was knocking the seals out of his transmission all the time. Well, when we put a camera in the car, it didn't take us too long to figure out. I knew what his seal problem was because it was bottoming out the drive shaft. Now, we had a situation, which is rare, I've never ever heard this before, but uh, on a car that Scott Busby drove for me out of California, we actually had an input or an output shaft that was twisted to the point where it would, it, it would only go in so far. So it looked like, it, I mean, you wouldn't know that it, it didn't have plenty of room, but it would only go in so far and it would hit the twisted part of that shaft and then it would bottom out. And we didn't realize that until one time when we were changing gears and and he went to shove it all the way in the transmission and didn't go in the transmission. So it's very possible that some of those kind of things can be going on. Uh, that you know, But normally if the car kicks out, uh, there's a, a lot of trail in the car. So could be too short a pull bar. Yeah, it could be too short a pull bar. Too short a pull bar. The longer the pull bar is, the longer it'll carry the traction down the straightaway. If you got a short pull bar in there, you'll have a ton of instant traction, but then you'll lose it as you go down the straightaway. Yeah, good point. Very good point. Um, Ryan, a few questions. Um, what is something... What is some things or trends we need to be aware of to be up to date in the com and competitive in 2003? Two, are you seeing guys running higher pinion angles for four link cars up to eight inches or nine inches of range? Um, and three, thoughts on running a eight inch tall right front spring? Um, well, let's take a question at a time. Um, trends, you know, man, the trend thing can almost be a weekly deal to the point where sometimes a lot of those trends, I think, are smoke and mirrors. 
so I'm a little cautious to jump on the bandwagon right off the bat and sell somebody a bunch of blue sky that I'm not 100% confident in. So uh, trends-wise, uh, you got any ideas trend-wise, Chad? Well, I mean, I've heard of some some more pinion angle. I mean, there's no doubt that pinion angle's traction, but there's a point where you can go too far also and damage your your uh, pinion shafts. So that's a, a touchy subject there. I mean, we're not traveling the pole bars as far as we used to, so you don't need as much uh, pinion angle per se, uh, but there is traction there. So I don't know if you heard something about a guy running more to get grip. I mean, that's, that's traction, no doubt about it. Uh, the eight inch tall right front spring, is that legal in IMCA or does it have to be both nine and a half or? Uh, yeah, it would not be legal in IMCA, but, but I'm not sure. If you're an open car and you, you, I think it was Swift that just made that new eight inch tall, right? And I believe he did that for a spring table thing, which is cool because that, you know, that definitely, uh, helps the spring table and gets the car in the right front running an eight inch tall right front and a nine and a half left front spring is going to tip that spring table on the front of the car and make the car rotate on the right front better. So uh, definitely some good thoughts there for sure. Yeah. Uh, let's see. We went to the class they offered over the winter and we got a lot more competitive this year. You know, that, to be honest with you, that, that's, I, I can't stress enough the fact of how good these classes actually are, and I'm not patting myself on the back. Uh, I think us as a team do an awesome job um, educating the racers on all kinds of things. And, and then, of course, you know, then you have that interaction with the, the classes, uh, with the questions, and, and then that spurs another thought. And, and so that works really well. Um, but I think those classes, if nothing else, it, it gets you thinking about things that you need to be checking. And, you know, it, it, it gets your mind back on the racing thing and you go home and you go, well, let's see, he talked about this. Let's check this. Oh, our car does this. Well, I don't think he said they were supposed to, they were supposed to do this. And, and then you, the thing that you do is you learn so much more about your race car that when it comes to race season, now all of a sudden when you run into questions or things like that, the answers are very similar or very easy to find because, of course, it's in your book or you've had that came up in class and we did this and we did that. Uh, Mark, I, I appreciate you mentioning that because, once again, I, you know, I think those classes are awesome. Um, help a lot of people. Um, Garrett wants to know, what's your opinion on running Torrington bearings on sliders? Yeah, I mean, we've, we've talked a lot about the Torrington bearings and their advantages. Uh, and it's just, it's about the spring twist. So when that spring is going through its travel and especially on the softer, the spring is the more uh, pronounced the problem is. So that spring, when it's going through its motion is twisting. So when you don't have the Torrington bearing on there, allowing that spring to to be relaxed and do its normal motion it's basically getting a twist force in that spring also and the torrington bearings relieve them and it actually extends the life of the springs mm -hmm. and them um, makes them work better and actually makes them rate or act like they're softer like their rate they're supposed to be instead of storing that energy and building up that extra rate so Torrington bearings are definitely a must. They're they're a maintenance item. Obviously, anything that takes grease and as a bearing is something you're gonna have to work on. I know it at the Jamboree there we were testing some dry lube graphite stuff that uh, that seemed to work really good. So and now I can't remember that manufacturer. <laughs> Dang it! Uh, but you know that's definitely something you need to I feel have on every corner of your car that stays in tension so the spring can't come loose from the cup otherwise the the bearing gets misaligned and that's kind of why we made the od grub stuff but even so you still need to have that stuff in tension for that bearing to work we've had some of them slam back down and it cracks the washer and uh, another little tip is that you know if your spring end coil is real sharp i would just grind a chamfer on that and that seems to be a common spot where it can snap them washers but 
definitely the Torrington Marings are a, a significant advantage, I feel. No, it's daylight and dark. I mean, it's it just, it, it frees everything up so much more and makes the whole car so much freer. It takes all that spring bind out of the car. Um, they're an absolute must. Chad, your coilover kit for your Penske and JRI, can you just buy a sleeve and the nuts still work since the Penske shock is larger body than the JRI? Yeah, so you the parts interchange, so the nuts and the jam nuts are all the same thread, so they'll screw on any of the sleeves. The The sleeve is what changes per manufacturer, and a couple of the cups are different, like Fox and AFCO have a goofy cup. Um, but the idea of that sleeve is what changes, but you can take the components, the nuts, and, and put them on any sleeve. So, yes, they interchange, and we do sell them separate. Joey, stop by to say hello. Keep up the great work, Bob and Chad. Oh, uh, yeah, Joy, I happened to see you uh, on Facebook the other day where you and my old buddy, Mr. Schrader, won a race down there with the BMOD. I didn't know if that was the BMOD that you and I had had that conversation about there uh, a month or so ago, but uh, I seen his picture with a trophy, so I thought that was pretty exciting. You'll have to tell him hi when you see him tomorrow or whenever you see him. Um, Ronald, how can I tell if my car has got a square stub or a turn stub? Well, the biggest thing that you can measure off of the lower ball joints and get a, and a, get, get a good idea, pick out a spot you know, find out where there's a square spot. A lot of times the motor plates are square in these cars. Um, so you can sometimes go off of the motor plate. Uh, but normally, though, like the rear, rear of the cars where the trailing arm mounts to, that's usually a jig point, and that's an awful square, another square point you can measure off of to the lower A-frames. Um, it's pretty hard to tell by looking at it. I mean, unless it's really turned a lot. I mean, if it's like our cars that are only turned five-eighths of an inch, you visually can't really see that without measuring it. Um, Brent, USRA B-Mod. I have three-quarter inch Heim solid pull bar. Is a smaller bar with five-eighths Heims? Yeah, I, I, yeah, answer to your question, no, I wouldn't. No. Not on a pull bar or a panty bar. Yeah, not not if not if I'm riding it. I, I would. I, I you definitely that three quarters what you need. Um, that that's 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 as light as I would go. Uh, there's so much load in those two points, and and so yeah, like Chad said, pull bar or panard bar, neither one of them. Anything under three quarters of an inch is is unsafe. Uh, William, will a biscuit bar work on a 600-pound horsepower UMP modified? Yes and no. We got we got some guys running the running a biscuit bar. Some guys running the biscuit in the spring together. Um, a lot depends on where you race too. I mean, depends on the grip levels in the track. I would say, um, but obviously. UMP, sticky tire, big power, hard on pull bar. Yeah, I, I would tend to lean towards that spring biscuit combination bar. I think it's a little bit more tunable, um, more adjustable, and I think it's a little bit more durable probably. Well, I'm not, I can't say that for sure because I've not really, I've not worked with a biscuit bar that much. You know, that canister biscuit bar that you have, that, that thing's pretty indestructible. Yeah, but it still gets beat up with that tire. So, it, I mean, we got guys running them, but you ain't going to get the longevity of of the spring no matter what you do with the pucks there. Joe, thank you so much. I have a ton of your stuff, and it's all top-notch. Jason, looking for recommendations for more drive off the corner for a stock car in the slick. Um, 
biggest thing with the stock cars is kind of the same thing we do with our sport mods. Uh, more angle in the left rear, less angle in the right rear. Um, offsetting that wheelbase, just depending on where you, you know, where you can kind of, how your car is actually built. Um, you know, we build all of our stock car stuff has got lead built into the car because uh, if we need it to turn, we can always put angle in that right rear trailing arm. So when we uh, uh, need traction, we raise that right bar. Shocks are a big thing with the stock cars. I mean, we, we really work a lot. I can't stress enough. Like I said, the shock package on those cars are, are phenomenal. And some of the stuff that we do, I still shake my head, but it seems to work great on the stock cars, especially in the slick. Aaron, I can attest to the four-link school. We went twice and learned a lot. Also, great customer service, both Bob and Chad. I appreciate that, Aaron. We uh, uh, enjoyed having you at the class. Uh, we enjoy the classes. Uh, I look forward to the classes every year. They're a lot of fun and uh, uh, just always looking forward. And like I was just, Chad and I were talking right before we went live here. And I, that's kind of my my next project i i spent quite a bit of time here the last couple of weeks in the shop doing some reorganization and, and some stuff kind of getting everything ready for our new guys to start and uh so next mech, my next mission is going to be uh schools chassis schools chad have you made a spring kit for a bilstein shock with the adjustment on the shaft next to the heim joint i'm not uh not familiar with the adjustable shafts you'd have to send me a picture uh email or messenger or something there I'm not familiar with that but i'm sure we could figure something out uh joshua what what's the fast setup for vegas and the sport mod thank you guys for all you do and answering these questions um you know, and I, <laughs> I've had a lot of people ask that question. What would you do going down there? And I've t and I've said this to numerous guys: go there with your standard setup. Don't don't go there with a setup that you're not used to running. Go there with your standard setup because I mean it's an oval racetrack. It's just a little bigger than most, but I mean it's an oval racetrack. So give the you know once you get there, give the car what it needs, and I mean, the car's going to tell you what it's wanting. Uh, I wouldn't go there with a specific setup any different than what you normally would run um, anywhere else. You'd run a half mile racetrack. That would be the setup that I would go with. Um, I hate to tell people to change their setups because once again. You know, your driver's used to a specific, a specific setup. He's used to how the car responds to the throttle. He's used to how the car responds to the right front and all that stuff. So don't change anything on him. Let him tell you what the car needs, you know, what the car's telling him it needs. Uh, Aaron, also, can we have our manual UltraForce upgraded to an automatic machine? I mean, technically we could convert it, but at that point you'd be better off uh, selling it as a used manual than just buying a new auto, uh, which the market ain't good. We're, we're still struggling to get the, the little touch screens for the automatic machines. I know the, the engineering team is currently uh, redoing the automatic machines with a different touch screen that's more available. So, uh, you know, AccuForce is who we get the automatic stuff from and, and they're frantically working to uh to come up with a new package there so that we can build the automatic machines again um hopefully uh the last i heard was january um so sounds like we're done till january with those but we have our our uh our standard manuals and then we have our graphing manual machine which is a, a kind of an in between the automatic and the manual so we debuted those at super nationals there we've had pretty good luck with them so you can run the test, you just run the test with the switch and, and it gathers the data and then you can lay it out and graph it on the machine. So it kind of gives you the, the data and the graphing capabilities of the auto, but you just have to run the test manually and 
and it's about 1500 to 2000 cheaper than an automatic machine so uh the the ultra force side we're always working on cool stuff there uh but that graphing manual is pretty awesome and we had a couple other little tweaks we're doing to that to to make it in my opinion the only machine that a unless you're bump stopping you really don't need an automatic the automatic is better for the pull bars and the puck bars but now with this manual one running the test uh and being able to graph it is is going to eliminate that option too so really excited about the graphing manuals taking away some of the luster of the automatic well logan how much drop do you run on the on in the, in the left front and how do you measure it um what i do is when the car's setting at ride height i measure the center to center of the left front shock and then what i do is i jack it up and i actually jack it up to the point where uh i jack it up one in, jack the frame up one inch so in other words if my shock measurement is 18 and 5 eighths inches center to center at right height I'll jack it up to 19 and 5 eighths inches center to center, and that's where I'll hook my chain. And then that's that's how I measure it, and that's the amount of drop now. I set my adjuster, and we use the Weir's quick adjuster, in the center so I can go to an inch and a half or I could go less. I've not had very good success going much less than the um, – one inch it seems like when we go try to tie it down a little bit too much the car starts getting a little bit more erratic so i, I pretty much stay with that one inch measurement one inch to one and a half seems to be a pretty good to, pretty good go to uh ted what spring cup do you recommend for the 22 grts right front um we run that that od grab cup that chad's got that's the drop cup um, that works really well, um, and especially like in IMCA where we we can't run different length springs. Uh, we can run different length drop cups and simulate that uh, overall spring table adjustment, and that seems to work very well. Uh, Jake. Looking at our latest spring biscuit pull bar you have, Bob, I'm currently running a double big biscuit pull bar now. It seems to travel about an inch and a quarter. I struggle a little bit on the super dry slick. Should I ditch the big biscuit bar and try your spring bar? Well, of course, I'm going to tell you that you definitely should. Um the, you know, the thing with that spring bar, it's, it's, the spring bar is so adjustable uh, and, and it's so forgiving where the, the biscuit bar, I, I don't know, you know, I, the biggest problem with the biscuit bar is how, how do you know when they go away and how, how long they last and, you know, where that spring bar is just a little bit more consistent. And like I said, it's more adjustable so that, you know, you can pull a puck out of there and, and change the travel of it. If, if for some reason, in other words, you're getting too much travel or not enough travel, you can always adjust it, and that works pretty well. It's a super easy adjustment, and uh, it works pretty good. Well, we have five more minutes left to go here. Anybody's, oh, yeah, here we go. Um, Joe, on an IMCA Sport Mod with – a light right front left rear spring setup. Do you expect the cross rate to be higher or lower than standard setup sheets of around 50.5? More than likely with the softer springs, you're going to have more. Um, it's it's very common to have a little bit more because uh, you're, you're going to have a little bit more left rear bite in it because you're, you're preloading it more. So, you know, it's definitely going to do something like that. Um, Brian, rubber side down. What was that? What's that related to? I'm not sure. Okay. Lots of lap. I agree. Uh, Dan, USRA B mod 16 inch right rear trailing arm. 
would a 17 inch bar do better? A 17 inch bar, once again, is a little longer, so it's a little bit slower to react. I think it gives you more, in my opinion, it's just like a long pull bar versus a short pull bar. Uh, it might not react as quickly as a 16 inch bar, but it will re react smoother and I last longer. So in my opinion, we run a 17 inch left rear bar and a 16 inch right rear bar just because uh, I don't want that car to, to jump up so fast and get a power push in or a throttle push in the middle of the corner. But then when it's coming up off the corner, I want more leverage to help get that tire in the ground more. So it gives us a little bit more uh, up off the corner. Um, would adding a spacer under or above the left rear spring help the spring table um, with using the soft left rear spring, trying to get it above the right rear height? Um, you know, it's, it's, it's possible that that could work. I, I would just be a little hesitant about that spring coming out from underneath there. Yeah, depending on what you have for cups. I mean, obviously, when you put a spacer under it an inch, your wedge bolt is going up an inch. So just make sure you don't do something there where you're going to, like Bob said, throw the spring out of there. But that definitely changes the spring table. I've seen a couple cars where they're built like that with uh, the right rear cup uh, tight to the to the tube, and then the left rear is up an inch or whatever. But if it's an IMCA car, I believe it has to be... They got to be the same. So uh, just be careful what you're doing there and and how you're doing it. I don't know what you run, but uh, definitely affects the spring table. But make sure you're legal. Yeah. No, it'd be a great idea. If the rules allow, that would be what I would do, is I would build the spring perch up all above the rear end on the left rear. But like, you know, IMCA, it's not something we can actually do. Uh Chad, he sent you a picture of that rod end for the Bill Steen. Thank you. We'll be Jeff in touch. Is, Jeff is saying buy Chad's two inch drop mount for the right rear to lower the right rear. I, I well, agree with that. That's, well, in a coilover car, I mean I think that I think that's a spring separate car with the spacer, but so to be clear, we need to can need to talk about if it's a coilover or not. So if it's yeah. a coilover, it doesn't matter where the spring is mounted or or how tall the spring is, you know, on a slider or a coilover, it, it only matters where it's bolted to the chassis. But on a spring separate screw jack car, then that's where that, I'm pretty sure that's where that spacer comes into play. Where them cups are mounted on the top and bottom and the spring heights affect the spring table. You bet. Well, we've got a couple more minutes here for another question or two. Uh, anything, Chad, you got? To talk about that you oh i know what i was going to mention the fact that uh, no, no, i forgot what i was going to mention sometimes you hate that when that thought goes right on through right on through to the other side yeah. I have that all, all day i walk around and i'll leave my office and i'll be going out back and somebody will stop me in the middle and i get out there and i'm like what the hell did i just come out here for <laughs> no, yeah, no doubt about that 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 yeah no doubt um, when's the next show uh, next show will be November 14th uh, we're going to take take the month take a month and we'll be back with November 14th um, talk about things on Good Friday and things about all that good stuff and all the we'll actually start our segment then about the different things that you need to work on over the winter uh, on your car to you know, freshen your car and the things, you know, the general maintenance stuff that needs to be done. Uh, Brent, USRA BMA, where's the common crankshaft center? 11 inches to the ground and inch and a half to the center right or left. Uh, normally, with a crate motor, we run, well, 11 inches would be fine. We actually run ours 12 inches. So our motor actually is up a little bit higher. 
and our motor sets dead center in the pro, in the frame rails. Uh, Bill said less pull bar angle, tighten entry on slick. Um, yeah, less pull bar would it would definitely tighten the car up on corner entry. There's no doubt about that. And and in reality, a lot of guys believe a less pull bar angle will actually get the car off the corner better. Uh, it might be a little bit lazier right smack in the middle of the corner, but it won't bust the tires loose as much as if you have have a lot of angle in there. Oh, yeah, Todd just turned on. Thanks, Todd. We appreciate you watching. Um, I know you're usually watching, and so, but anyway. All right, well, another episode of Speed Tips by Bob and Chad. And we look forward to seeing everybody here on uh, uh, November 14th. And like I said, we'll start our off-season maintenance uh, and anything else that you guys want to talk about. That'll be uh, uh, definitely the things to go through. So thanks again for watching and uh, keep in touch. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for